that's a shame. Thank you for letting me know. Well, naturally, I'll need to uh, very quickly go over all these things again. So uh, the two types of polymers we're going to discuss today, I would say, are addition polymers and condensation polymers. Uh, in the case of addition polymers, we find that all of the atoms in the monomer make it into the final polymer product. That is not the case for condensation polymers. In condensation polymers, some of the atoms in the monomers do not make it into the final polymer product. Addition polymers have at their start radicals, which are species like this, which, which have an unpaired electron. So, not all radicals have to be carbon radicals. You can have a radical on any atom, on an oxygen or a nitrogen and so forth, but you can consider radicals to be somewhere in between carbocations and carbanions when they exist on, uh, on carbon. What we've done over here is to show the steps by which we build up uh, a polyethylene molecule, starting with our radical initiator. Probably doesn't hurt for me to go over this again anyway. Uh, and so, uh, the, the radical initiator is not always, but often a peroxide of this type. These have an extremely weak oxygen-oxygen bond that's, that's very easily broken with just mild heat. And so you get two of these alkoxy radicals. So the alkoxy radical reacts with, um, actually, I just remembered I forgot something in this. So it's good that we're going over this again. But the alkoxy radical reacts with our monomer. I'm just using ethylene here as an example of a monomer to give this radical, and that can react with yet another uh, ethylene monomer to give this radical, which can react with yet a third monomer molecule and give a third radical. And you can imagine this goes on and on and on, thousands and tens of thousands and maybe millions of times. What I neglected to mention earlier was that eventually you're going to run out of the ethylene because you don't have an infinite supply. Eventually you're going to run out. And what happens at that point is you'll have this really long chain radical finding another really long chain radical and the two radicals come together and make an even electron species. So you wind, that's called the termination of the reaction. It sounds very violent, but the reaction is said to terminate at that point when you run out of the monomer. So uh, what we then started to get into was, uh, it, it, this is not really the most convenient way to draw polyethylene. But uh, in order to draw the structure of uh, addition polymers, I think this is the best way to do it. It's certainly compact and logical. Uh, so what you do is given the structure of the monomer, in this case, ethylene, you turn the double bond into a single bond and you extend bonds out from those two carbon atoms. It's going to be something like ethylene that you'll be starting with. And we'll do a couple more examples as well. Uh, after that, you add parentheses to show that everything inside the parentheses is a repeating unit. And then you add N to show that repeating unit repeats N times. From N molecules of ethylene, we get this polyethylene molecule. And yes, it is true at the very ends of the molecule, you're going to have these alkoxy kind of caps on the molecules. But I think you'll agree if N is 10 or 20,000 or even hundreds of thousands or millions, these alkoxy groups are a non-factor. They don't play any significant role in the structure at all. So we can safely ignore them. We can say this type of repeating unit is what overwhelmingly makes up the structure of, of the addition polymer. And I wanted to do a couple other examples. Let's say instead of, of ethylene, we took N molecules of vinyl chloride, which is a molecule that looks like this and we add all those together, our polymer will then look like this. And uh, this is polyvinyl chloride. Technically, you're supposed to put vinyl chloride in parentheses because you want to make it clear that it's not polyvinyl chloride, it's polyvinyl chloride. And you've certainly heard of PVC pipes. There's all kinds of consumer products that are made of PVC. Same thing with polyethylene. Think of all of the uh, reusable food containers, uh, reusable and disposable food containers that you can get, all of the bottles and bottle caps that are made of polyethylene. Think of your plastic wrap is probably made of polyethylene. Certainly plastic bags will be made of polyethylene. It's made by the millions of tons every day. 
there's all kinds of consumer products that use polyethylene. Let me just do one more. Another real famous monomer is styrene with a benzene ring. And so sure enough, you will get polystyrene out of this. That's polystyrene. And polystyrene has hundreds of commercial and uh, consumer uses as well. Uh, you will be familiar with styrofoam, styrofoam peanuts. That's made of polystyrene that's been inflated with some sort of um, inflation agent, you know, some sort of gas. Uh, polystyrene is also used as a solid. It's generally fairly crystalline. Uh, sometimes if you go to a party and there are punch cups, do you know the kind of clear punch cups that if you bend them, they'll break? They're kind of brittle. Those are made of polystyrene. The other types that don't break are probably, th that are bendable are probably made of polyethylene. So again, I, I, you're beginning to see, I hope, just from these few examples of polymers, how many things we use on a daily basis that are, that are made of polymers or, or include polymers in their makeup. So I think that's all I really need to say for now about addition polymers, except this issue of stereochemistry. Let me call up this uh, page from your class notes, which um, one thing that I conveniently left out is the idea that in an addition polymer chain, you could have chiral carbon atoms. And there's basically three possibilities of how those chiral carbon atoms can be arranged, three different tacticities as they're called. And uh, one possibility is there's no pattern whatsoever. The, the, uh, those side chains, those Rs are just randomly uh, um, arranged. And we call that type of polymer A tactic. That prefix A is pretty familiar meaning not. So there's, there's no tacticity. Another, Another word your book uses to describe atactic polymers is to say they're stereo random because there's nothing governing which direction that R group points. Another possibility is for all of the R groups to, to have the same stereochemistry. So all of those uh, carbon atoms will be R or all of them will be S. They will have only one stereochemistry. And we call that type of polymer chain isotactic. There is yet a third kind in which they alternate, RS, RS, let's say. And we call that a syndiotactic polymer chain. So these are stereoregular polymers. Uh, and that, that's really the only bit of that one section, I think 14.5, that I really wanted to mention. I, I really don't care if you learn about Ziegler Natta catalysts or anything like that. I think that's, that's, ask, that, that's, that's asking a bit much at the undergraduate level. If this were a graduate course in polymers, we'd surely go there, but not in an undergraduate class. I don't think that's reasonable. Uh, as you can imagine, it takes special um, catalysts in order to get the stereoregular chains, the isotactic and syndiotactic chains. And as you can also imagine, those catalysts are really expensive. Uh, because the isotactic and syndiotactic polymer chains will have special properties because they're regular. They're going to be much more crystalline uh, in general, other things being equal than the atactic polymer. The atactic polymer tends to be what we call amorphous, meaning that it's not crystalline. It's, they're generally just kind of, a, kind of powdery. They don't usually have much, uh, uh, much shape or crystallinity to them, whereas uh, the, the isotactic and syndiotactic polymers will be much more crystalline. But you can, in principle, get any one of these three from any given uh, uh, monomer, even the ones we just talked about. I wouldn't be surprised if you could get atactic, isotactic, and syndiotactic polystyrene, atactic, isotactic, and syndiotactic polyvinyl chloride. And I would guess they would all have different properties. At least I think that would be the most reasonable. Oh, you know what? I just realized uh, the people in chat couldn't see that. Let me do this new share. So those of you in chat, I was talking about this page of your class notes, but I already have the structures written down in your class notes and all the terms. So sorry about that. I forgot to make this visible to everyone, but that's already in your class notes. 
So you're not really missing anything uh, other than that. Let me close that out. And let me go back to the whiteboard. Good. Well, that's pretty much all I have on uh, addition polymers at any rate. I'd like to spend the rest of the time talking about condensation polymers. Uh, so we have about 20 minutes. Questions so far then? All right. Well, you know what? I think I will just do this since our only other topic is condensation polymers. So unlike addition polymers, condensation polymers typically involve two monomers, not just one. And all of the monomer, all of the reactions that these two monomers will undergo are ones we know about already from chapter 10 on carboxylic acids and acyl derivatives. So uh, I'm gonna talk about four types of condensation polymers. I will admit one of them is not in your book, but it's so common. It's such an important type of polymer. They're polycarbonates. And there are things that you will have run into. I figure it's worth mentioning. I won't spend a huge amount of time on it, but uh, it leaves a big hole if I don't mention it. First, let's talk about polyamides. And polyamides are also called nylons. You'll probably have heard of nylons. Um, but uh, the way polyamides are made is the same way that atom, amides are made. We already know that you can take a carboxylic acid and some primary or secondary amine, let's say, some molecule of this type, and you will get an amide might take quite a bit of heat, but you will get an amide of this type plus a molecule of water. And how do we use that to make a polymer? Well, we're gonna play a trick on the molecule. What we're going to do is take some dicarboxylic acid Let's just use this one. And we're going to treat it with a diamine. Maybe something like this. I'll even use a different color. So, but we'll, we'll add some diamine, maybe with six CH2s. And let's just think through for a moment what's going to happen. This carboxylic acid can react with that amino group and make an amide but there's an amino group on the other side of the molecule that can react with the carboxylic acid group on another molecule and make an amide. There's then another carboxylic acid group on the other end of that molecule that can react with an amine and make an amide. There's then another amine on that side of the molecule that can react with the carboxylic acid and make an amide. There's another carboxylic acid on that side, on the other side of the molecule. You see where this is going. It's gonna keep going thousands and tens of thousands and millions of times. And so you can build up a polymer that way, of which there's multiple correct ways to draw the polymer, but one way that you might draw it might be something like this. The trick to drawing addition polymers, I'm sorry, condensation polymers, is you wanna be sure that you include all of the monomer atoms that make it into the product exactly once. Now, this NH group is going to find the carbonyl group of another carboxylic acid. In other words, it will look just like this carbonyl group. That then goes to the benzene ring, to the other carbonyl group, which forms an amide with amino group, then six CH2s, then a nitrogen, then another carbonyl group. So I think you see, we're already there. This is not the only correct way to draw the structure of that polymer, but something like that would be one correct way. Now you could, if you wanted, put the nitrogen first, let's say. As long as all of the atoms that are included in the polymer structure make it into the polymer. And you will also get water molecules out of it. That's why they call them condensation polymers, because the reaction's a condensation reaction, meaning that it spits out small molecules like water or HCl. So that would be an example of a nylon or a polyamide. And uh, 
Where are nylons used? Well, they're used in clothing. We understand that. Uh, they're used in sutures, I'm pretty sure. There are plastic automotive parts that are made of a type of nylon. Uh, instrument strings, I'm more of a woodwind guy than a string instrument guy, but instrument strings can be made of nylon. If you play guitar or violin, you can get nylon strings. Uh, and that's been available since the 40s when uh, nylon was, was uh, first prepared. So that's one example of a condensation polymer is one of these polyamides. And all you need to know to understand polyamides is that carboxylic acids plus amines make an amide. That's all there is to it. It's the same reaction. It's just we're playing a trick on it by having a molecule with two carboxylic acid functional groups and a molecule with two amine functional groups. Other than that, it's, it's, it's exactly the same reaction. We covered that in chapter 10. And in fact, all of these reactions are chapter 10 type. Uh, I also want to talk about polyesters. Uh, polyesters are made in the same way that esters are. We already know that if you take a carboxylic acid plus an alcohol, then you will get an ester. That was also a chapter 10 reaction. And of course, you'll also get a molecule of water. So we're gonna play the exact same trick. Let's take something with two carboxylic acid functional groups, maybe with four CH2s. I'm kind of making it up as I go along. And let's treat it with something uh, like ethylene glycol with two CH2s. Well, you'll have the carbonyl of the carboxylic acid then the four CH2s that are between the two carbonyls, then another carbonyl, and then you'll have, oh, I should have made this colored. Well, I will, I'll do like this. Then you'll have the oxygen of the alcohol, then two CH2s, then another oxygen. That oxygen is going to be attached to a carbonyl group, much like this one. And then you'll have two, four CH2s, then another carbonyl, oxygen, CH2CH2 oxygen, then another carbonyl. So that's going to be your repeating unit. And again, this is not the only correct way to draw it, but that's an example of a polyester. And of course, you'll also get a large number of water molecules out of this. But polyesters are made the same way regular esters are. It's just we've played this trick on the molecule. By, um, by having two carboxylic acids on one molecule and two alcohols on the other one. And in so doing, when you heat them together, you can give off molecules of water and make a polymer chain that looks like this. Uh, polyesters are in fabrics, as you know. Liquid crystals are sometimes polyesters. And uh, insulating tape is generally made of a polyester. So polyesters have been around for a long time. Uh, I'm old enough to remember, though I was a very young child, polyester leisure suits from the 70s. I probably had one when I was a little boy. I'm sure there are pictures somewhere. I don't want them ever to get out. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's polyesters. Uh, I also want to talk just briefly about polycarbonates. Uh, polycarbonates are made by taking phosgene. I don't really care if you memorize this molecule is called phosgene, but it is P-H-O-S-G-E-N-E. -E. Very dangerous molecule, by the way. It was a poison gas used in World War I. Uh, and what we're going to do is treat this with some diol. And what you wind up getting is one alcohol group uh, replacing the chlorine on one side and another alcohol group replacing it on the other. And then phosgene molecules come in. Essentially, what you get is a molecule that looks like this. And this is an example of a polycarbonate. Uh, but polycarbonates show up a lot. Uh, polycarbonate lenses are used in eyeglasses. Probably your glasses lenses are a polycarbonate. I know mine are. Um, those 
Those are rigid water bottles made out of Nalgene. Nalgene is a polycarbonate. Um, CDs and DVDs, to the extent we still use them, are made of a polycarbonate. So they're, they're very hard like that. And last but not least, uh, polyurethanes. This is still technically a chapter 10 type reaction, but you make a urethane or a carbamate by taking a functional group known as a, uh, um, an isocyanate and you add an alcohol. And you get a molecule that looks like this. And uh, in fact, in this case, you don't get any water molecules. So that comes from the alcohol. So that's called a urethane or a carbamate. Urethane's the older name. Carbamate is the newer name. And in order to get a polyurethane, we'll do the same trick on these molecules as we did before. We'll just take some molecule that has two isocyanate groups. Maybe we'll put a benzene ring in between. And let's take ethylene glycol again. Uh, you know what, let me, yeah, I've got time. Let me actually make that red so it's easier to see. And so the structure of the product that you get Oh, I forgot to make that red. We'll look something like this. This is an example of a polyurethane. And you've probably heard of polyurethane foams and resins. They've, uh, they've got a lot of use in adhesives and uh, insulation, things like that. But the three that are mentioned in your book are polyamides, polyesters, and polyurethanes. I just really wanted to mention polycarbonates also because they're, they're used so much. Uh, they're, they're, yeah, they're generally quite hard like that. So they have some desirable properties. And with that, I guess I'm out of material. Any questions on any of these condensation polymers? Well, if not, again, I want to thank you guys for being the 20% of the class that actually showed up and hung in there with me. It's been a tough semester and you've worked very hard. Uh, I, again, can't speculate about what will happen with the grade cutoffs. Oh, you have a question, I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, I don't know that that's true for all addition polymers, but it wouldn't surprise me. Maybe because, maybe it's because condensation polymers have sites in them where they can react, where the two molecules came together. And I don't know that that's really true for addition polymers. I would expect them to stand up for a very, very long time. I thought though that there were some addition polymers that certain bacteria could break down. Um, I'm not an expert in that field, but that was my understanding. Is that kind of what you meant though? Yeah, that, I'm afraid that's the best I can do in terms of an answer. But you guys have hung in there through a very tough semester. I'm proud of all of you. So um, like I said, give me until sometime next week to update your estimated class grades again. I expect I'll be able to do that. Uh, Monday and Wednesday class will be replaced with extended office hours. I will be either in my office or someone nearby and I'll, or someplace nearby and you can, 
I'll, I'll leave a note saying where you can get me. Um, don't forget about Bella Day on Thursday, noon on Thursday. That's Bella Day, assuming the weather holds up. If it's pouring down rain, I really don't want to waterlog Kitty. I'm assuming you can understand that. But, uh, but yeah, other than that, it's been a pleasure. And I will see you all on the day of the final exam.